there was a season of life where you were in counterterrorism. I know. I know. Help us bridge yeah. that gap. Counterterrorism. Yeah. <laughs> helping people write yeah. viral TED Talks. It's not the l obvious career leap. And they're like, all right, Ashley, you're promoted. You're gonna go travel to all these really scary places. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, I don't wanna do that. This TED Talk kind of saved me in yeah. a way. I've never thought about it like that. It's kind of saved my life. Like, it literally could have. It gave me something to go somewhere and it quantum leaped me. I got a speaking agent. He put me on a speaking tour. I took my keynote fees from 5K each to 30K each talk. I got six book deals and I got an international licensing deal on my courses in Asia that I still get royalties from. The TEDx brand is a democracy of ideas. They're not looking for famous people. They are looking for people who wanna be there with something to say. But the thing about going viral is that it may not be easy, but it's simple. Simply. Ashley Stahl, welcome back to Powerhouse Women. Do you remember? You were actually on the podcast. I want to say it was like my first year of podcasting. Even. I was just thinking about that just when I was coming babies. here and it left my little brain because then yeah. I saw you again and you feel like a new person in your I own am. way. Yeah, that's how it is. <laughs> and I think that's how it is when you're a content creator, yeah. you're a reflective person. You know, every year of life is different than the yeah. last. So yeah, I'm I know. excited to be here. Which one of my favorite parts of your story when I was even like reviewing the form we have people submit is like the reminder that there was a season of life where you were encountered terrorism I know. I know jesus take the wheel <laughs> jesus take the wheel that, like help us bridge yeah. that gap counterterrorism yeah. helping people write yeah. viral ted talks yeah it's not the obvious career leap yeah yeah and i was a career coach before that so yeah. i just did a hail mary there too yeah yeah um okay well counterterrorism actually right now i have an agency and we it's called wise whisper agency and we write in book tedx talks and the gap is actually not as surprising as you would think because TEDx has been one of the most important parts of my life since I worked in national security. Yeah, yeah. So I remember getting an award for working in Obama administration. It was so long ago. Mm -hmm. And this woman walked into the ceremony and she was like this stunning woman that kind of like captured everybody's attention. It was her energy. Yeah. And she came to talk to me and she was just saying that she'd just given a TED talk at the UN. And I remember looking at her and saying like, oh my gosh, I would love to do that someday. And I said it like it's so far away because number one, I'd never spoken on a stage in my life. Number two, I didn't even know what I would speak about. Like I was 23, 24 years old, mm -hmm. but she looked at me and it was almost like a cartoon. She was like, I'm sure you'll speak on that stage soon. And she smiled and it was like, chink, like her tooth, like just like a cartoon. And I just remember being like, okay, lady, like definitely not. And she ended up shooting me a text message the next week. I was in Istanbul. It was 2012. There were protests in Taksim Square. I don't know if anybody remembers listening to this, what a mm. weird time that was, but there was tear gas in the air. And I was squinting my eyes and in cover, running for cover. And I felt a buzz on my phone. And I looked down through my like watery eyes and it was this girl and unknown number. And she just said, hey, do you remember me from the event? I recommended you to speak at TEDx Berkeley. And I think they're gonna take you because they take my referrals seriously, so good luck. And I just remember being like, what? Like, no way. Like so much imposter syndrome and also kind of like legitimate understanding of the fact that I had no experience at all. Like who am I to even speak on the, anything? Yeah. So I got an email when I got back to my motel that day and I was already kind of feeling like national security. Like I was way too sensitive of a person for it. Like there, it takes a very clear personality type for that career. Yeah. And I'm not that personality yeah. type. I can't even watch it fictitionally in movies. Like- I get too into the fictitious stories yeah. of what yeah. happens. Yeah, imagine your nervous system like mm -hmm. in a fictitious thing, like when you're actually in it every single day. Mm -hmm. The one thing I did take away from national security is, I guess pun intended, I've never said that before, but I'm a straight shooter. So- um, See what you did there. Yeah, I see what I did there. <laughs> like I, I know the limits of my knowledge and I acknowledge those because when working in national security, it's really a matter of life or death for people if you say you know something and you don't. Yeah. And so in business, I don't sell to people that I can't help. I don't mm -hmm. say yes when I mean no. Like I am a straight shooter. I think it was drilled into me literally through the military. Yeah. But at the time when I got this TEDx talk, I was like, man, I'm not even, I don't even know what I'm gonna say, but I don't wanna be in national security because I'm way too sensitive for this career. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize it at the time, but this TEDx talk would pivot my career. And now I know as a business owner, especially in the TEDx arena, mm -hmm. that 
TEDxes are one of the most powerful things you could do to skyrocket your personal brand. They're also a powerful way to put your sh- you know thing in the ground and have a new career path. A lot of corporate people leave corporate and become speakers, become entrepreneurs through yeah. it. It's a launch pad. It's a pivot yeah. point. So I got on stage and I remember like, first of all, even before getting on stage, I go back to the hotel room and I put the curtain behind me in my um, bathroom of the hotel. And because they wrote back and they said, hey, we would love a speaking reel. I'm like, well, what's a speaking reel? <laughs> hold, hold, please. Hold, please hold. I have like an iPhone 2 or whatever <laughs> iPhone it was in 2012. I was thinking like a Blackberry. Yeah, like what was Sidekick, like a Tamagotchi. <laughs> like I don't even know what I was like looking at. But I remember I just kind of like Googled like what is a speaking reel? And I remember being like, okay, don't have that. So I put this curtain behind me and I just got in front of my iPhone and recorded mm-hmm. some weird video of me and sent it to these curators. I don't even know what I said. I was going to ask if you still have it. I was just somewhere. thinking about it. And yeah. I think there's some part of me that's scared to look for it. Like, I really Valid. Am. Because, uh, you know, the truth is I probably could dig it up. Mm. Maybe I will. But yeah, so I ended up getting the talk by some sort of miracle. Mm. And I hired a speaking coach. Thank God I did that because yeah. this would have been a train wreck. Yeah. I, I mean, especially like, for TED. Yeah. For TED, it's a specific format. It's a framework. It's all the things. And like, way to just dive in the actual deep end yeah, of speaking. I mean, the thing about it, there's so much about TEDx that people don't know. And mm-hmm. I always tell clients that come into my agency, like I proudly am not affiliated with TEDx. And I don't yeah. say that to insult TEDx. Yeah. But what I do know is that the TEDx brand does not want entrepreneurs on stage trying to get clients. But what is the truth of the matter? The most seasoned best speakers or the people that have the most living inside of them, usually they tend to have some sort of entrepreneurial spirit, mm. entrepreneurial objective. And those are the best speakers for these talks quite often. Activists with movements, whatever have you. Those activists want donations. They want philanthropic whatever. So everybody tends to have a goal when they put that much work into a talk. Yeah. So I actually think the organization's mindset that they don't want to attract people that want opportunities from them mm. is antiquated. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm happily not affiliated with yeah. them. I'm just an entrepreneur that wants more entrepreneurs for that exact objective to yeah. get these talks. So yeah. I got on stage for my first one. I was after Guy Kawasaki, who those of you who don't know, like really investor in Apple of all places. So just casual. I mean, but just I will no say, life ambition at all. In that literally. Guy. And he was not even, I mean, obviously he wasn't nervous. He was like acting like he was at the mall. Like it's just another day for this guy. But for me, this was like yeah. my worst night. And looking back, it was 49% worst thing ever, 51 best thing I've ever done for my entire mm. career. But the people backstage were all panicking and scared. And it was so humbling for me at 24, 25 to think to myself like, oh, wow, the nerves never end. Like these people are freaking out. And they're seasoned. They're older than me. They're Mm -hmm. so much further along. I've never spoken on a stage in my life. These people are speakers, a lot of them. And so I got on after Guy Kawasaki and I gave it my best. And the talk ended up going viral. The funny thing is like, imagine your first try at speaking going viral. It's kind of a weird thing. You kind of don't want that. Yeah. You're like, I don't want my starter pack to go this far. (laughs) And so, you know, Mm -hmm. the the gift in all of it was that I probably, I was able to leave national security which I wasn't like suffering, you know, like mm-hmm. I was really good at my work, um, but it was really high risk work. I was working in a pilot program for the Pentagon. It was for Afghanistan. 14 ambassadors at the State Department had asked to get this program in their country. It was all hot zones, high risk mm-hmm. zones. And they're like, all right, Ashley, you're promoted. You're going to go travel to all these really scary places. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, I don't want to do that. That sounds like a really bad idea for me. And so this kind of this TED talk kind of saved me in wow. a way. I've never thought about it like that. It's kind of saved my life. Like it literally could have. It gave me something to go somewhere and it quantum leap me. So I ended up not only walking off that stage, but I started a career coaching business right then and there because there were really no women at the Pentagon that were as like seasoned in leadership and it really mm. bugged me. Mm. Um and it I don't I don't I don't even know if I have an opinion on if it's anybody's fault that, that it is that way. Sure. I don't even know what conclusion I could draw there. But what I can say is that it just made me sad that there wasn't that energy in the room. And I really needed that. Like there's one woman at DOD who was like a mother figure for me Mm. and she helped me grow and she made me feel safe. And because of that safety, I became a leader. And, and I think that's what we need to really step up. And, and so I just wanted to help other people be there. Yeah. And it was also the recession. Friends couldn't get jobs. And so I became a career coach that day of that TEDx talk, literally, is what it felt like. I booked my first coaching group because people just came up to me and I was like, yep, mm-hmm. email me. We'll do a coaching group. Mm-hmm. 
eight people from the audience signed up. Wow. And I left my job in national security. Yeah. And I ended up doing a million dollars in revenue from that TEDx talk in my coaching practice in the years to follow. And it wasn't even that great of a talk in my humble opinion, but I always wanted to make good with myself on it because I was like, oh, I hate that this is the representation of me, but Mm -hmm. I appreciate it for Mm -hmm. what it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was telling people over the years, you got to do a TED talk. These things are nuts. Like they're a must do. So I gave my second TEDx talk in 2019. And that one, I was a seasoned speaker by that point. I had also attracted a speaking agent um, through that TEDx talk that took me to new heights. And I'd gone through a whole journey. I had a career coaching business. I had online courses. I had a book deal. I have my podcast still, the U-Turn podcast. My book was called U-Turn, is called U-Turn. And by the way, the second TEDx talk, um, that one I wrote with that level of excellence. Like I'd been yeah. working. I had things to say. Yeah. And I respected it. Uh, a lot of people don't really respect the opportunity. You know, friends we have, they're brilliant. They'll say, oh, we flow when we speak. We channel. I'm like, channel all you want, but don't channel on the TEDx talk. This is not at the this place. This is not the channel spot. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, most people don't realize that the best speakers in the world, they memorize every single word and they yeah. usually have two to three keynotes. Yeah. And one of the biggest mistakes speakers can make is trying to have a keynote on everything, trying to satisfy yeah. every inquiry. You know, you really need to own your lane, own your expertise. Mm. And TEDx is a place that you can really put that in the ground and, and root that. Yeah. So the second one was called how to figure out what you really want. And that one went unicorn viral, but it nobody watched it for the first six months upon its release, which really? is very humbling and interesting. What do you mean by unicorn viral? Is there a stand? Is that like a million? That's it's views? Ten, I've got about ten million views now, oh, and it's on the wow. top one hundred TED Talks wow. of all time. Yeah. Crazy. Ashley. Isn't that wild? And I'm sitting here with you. Yeah, I mean, oh my gosh, I'm such a big deal. <laughs> just like an entrepreneur grinding and eating shit sometimes, just like all of us. Just like all of yeah. us. But um, wow. yeah, that talk, Incredible. I poured myself in. I respected the assignment. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. open up that talk with this moment for my dad. He was in the kitchen and he got a phone call and somebody had claimed that they'd kidnapped me. And I walk right. people through that story. And so that talk just went wild, but nobody watched it for six months. And it really taught me that these things are brand assets that move on their own time and on their own terms. Mm -hmm. But the thing about going viral is that it may not be easy, but it's simple. Simply Mm -hmm. write the best talk of your life. If you want to go viral, like get your game on, you know what I mean? And so I think a lot of people show up for that and they think like, this is another talk. It is important, but I have other things going on. No, clear your clear your decks and give it your best. Mm. Or, you know, my firm, we are totally done for you. Shameless plug. In four Zoom yeah. calls, we write and book the whole thing. So yeah. we have a lot of high achieving people coming in. Some right. of them don't even know what they have to say, but they know there's something in them. Yes. Yeah. And we're really helping them pull that out and take yeah. the work off. And I think that's why we've been so successful is because the brand feels kind of opaque for people. People don't know what is TED? What is TED X? What's the difference? Does it matter what city my talk is in? How do I get one of these? How do I write it right? Yeah. And then there's all sorts of guidelines that get you banned from the TED channel, especially if you're in wellness or medical. Sure. So it's a whole planet. Yes. And I think what I, my relationship to it is just knowing, like we know the brand. Yeah. We know what a platform it can be for countless examples of people. Yeah. I want to kind of scale it back to the person who hopefully is still listening to this, hasn't completely tuned it out because what they're telling themselves right now is I'm too early on. I don't have anything to say. Major imposter syndrome. Yeah. Yeah. You were thrust into this TED ec- or the TED opportunity, and now you have the opportunity to work with people who are like you. Probably similar to this woman who did it for you. You see the greatness in other people that yeah. probably aren't seeing it in themselves yet. Yeah. What's your message to those people, or how does someone know if they are ready? I mean, I don't take on people that don't feel like they really have something to say, but I do take on people that know they have something to say they just don't know what it is it's like in them and it's trying to get out yeah um so i would say if you just don't really feel like you have something to say yet something's not coming out of you you don't have content about what you want to say that's okay take your time get to Mm. it when you're ready but what i will say is that everyone knows something that other people would get value from and what's obvious to you is not obvious for a lot of people especially when it comes to your unique talents and gifts and My first book, U-Turn, was all about that. Like the message of the book was don't do what you love, do what you are, figure out who you are and and use that zone of genius in your life. And so for me, my zone of genius has always been writing in words. And I actually open up the U-Turn book 
in preschool where the principal told all the kids, like, tell, tell the parents who you want to be when you grow up. And I remember I said, I want to be a mom and a poet. And then That's I went so into counterterrorism and did all this other stuff. Like close, <laughs> close, close, but not, you know, like, wah, wah, wah. yeah, like I read all these Shel Silverstein books and then I became some sort of Sheryl Sandberg and <laughs> not the right one. A pantsuit and all. Yeah, pantsuit girl. Yeah. 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 And so wow. I feel like I finally have been back to myself now with TEDx. But what I will say to the person listening is ask yourself a few questions. Well, I have many. The first one is. If you could have the world know one thing that you really get, like what do you really get that you wish the world would kind of get? Mm. And if the world got it, how would things be better for everybody? Mm. So that's one really big question. Ooh, that's so good. But I'm about to completely cancel that question out because here's why. I really don't like that TEDx talks about the one idea we're spreading. I always tell clients who come in to write and book their TEDx talks, I'm like, listen, YouTube owns the party. It's a YouTube talk, right? TEDx is so the bouncer true. at the door. Like, don't matter. Who cares about the bouncer? Let's just say the right thing to get through the bouncer. To get you on stage. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's yeah. such an interesting way to think about it. You're right. So I look at it through the lens of what does well on YouTube. Mm -hmm. What does well on YouTube is original thinking, gripping content. And there are certain things that help you go viral, right? Like the title. If you have a bad title, it's, it's, it's like going to a white elephant party and it's like the ugliest gift mm. with like snot on it in the corner. Like people aren't going to open up that present. No. Yeah. They're going to look for the nice gift. Yeah. That's the title, right? Yeah. Like you can't even go viral without a click, right? But people get really obscured by TEDx because they think about the one idea we're spreading. And I'm like, stop thinking about that. Stop taking highly talented people and dwindling them down to one idea. Yeah. That actually takes a very smart person and puts their focus on one tiny thing when their brain is so much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. So I like to ask people, what do you want out of this thing? What do you want for your business? What do you want for your career? Number one. Number two, what is that customer wanting? What is the topic that that customer is, is needing the most, right? So for example, we had a leadership coach and after kind of digging with her and learning, like, how are you helping clients? What are you doing? Obviously, she wants more clients from her TEDx yeah. talk. And she has a lot of corporate clients. She said, well, when I really get honest with myself, I'm really helping people with burnout in corporations. Mm -hmm. And I'm helping their talent, like, get back online. Like, great. If you can only have three or four conversations about burnout with people ever, what are the most important things you'd have to make sure they get? And... I just let the client riff until they say something that as I'm doing my own body scan as a creative director yeah. for you know driving this TED talk to the right place, I just think to myself, what are they saying that is hitting me personally? Yes. Like I'm taking yeah. something back. It keeps coming back for me. Like I want to ask more about that. I want them to say more about yeah. it. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. Hum on a human level, all of us can get value from each other. So I just wait until I'm getting value and I, I can't like tout myself. But after having a team write and book more than 100 TEDx talks, I've heard a lot of personal development, a lot of leadership mm -hmm. advice, a lot mm -hmm. of everything. Mm -hmm. And it's it's special when somebody says something that touches because I've heard so much. And so from there, we usually say, okay, that thing you just said, let's stop there. And in a, a TED Talks are 10 to 18 minutes. So, you know, if you're really looking at that, a nine to 10 minute talk is three to three and a half pages. An 18-ish minute talk is like six pages typed times mm -hmm. New Roman 12. Not double space, but slippery slope because it's a speech. You write with a bunch of enters. Right. So I just tell clients all the time, like, why would you want to memorize 18 minutes when you can memorize 10? Like, why? What, what is this And talk? get the point across. Yeah. Like you said, starting with the end in mind of what do you want this to do for you? Yeah. But getting past the bouncer yeah. to get the invitation to yeah. go and deliver The bouncer it. keeps being like, what's your one idea? And I'm just like, who cares? What is the best of you? That's what I want to know. Mm. And the funny thing about that is after we write the whole talk with like their topic, their goal in mind and their best content, usually the one idea we're spreading comes out anyway. Yeah. So we just don't even think about it until yeah. the last phone call that yeah. they have with us. And we only do four calls and they're an hour and a half each. So there's a lot of depth there. Yes. But it's not even till the end that we're yeah. like, oh, we're looking at this and this is the message. And um, our talent, um, some of our creative directors wrote speeches for Steve Jobs and his executive team. We've got some visionaries. And so the creative directors, it, it is natural for them to be able to think of that after yeah. they have a talk in front of them. I also tell clients there's a really big difference between 
a message, a one idea worth spreading sort of a thing mm. and a theme, mm -hmm. right? So if we go back to that leadership coach, she did a talk on burnout with us. And, you know, from there, there's many ways to open up a talk, right? You could open up a TED talk about burnout, talking about somebody in the hospital bed. This is their lowest moment. You can open up talking about statistics and how, you know, society is really str struggling and painting a picture. We opened up with her the first time she had fun again. And oh. it was just her at the beach. And we realized yeah. after writing the talk about burnout that one of the themes was fun. Yeah. And we asked a lot of reflection, reflective questions to the audience about what does it mean to you to have fun? Mm -hmm. When's the last time you had fun? Mm -hmm. And so that wasn't an idea worth spreading as much as just a message yes. uh, or, a, or a theme that we wanted to kind of get through, I mean. And so, yeah, these these talks are like layer cake. Mm -hmm. um, but when once you start to structure them, I think anyone, no matter where they are, no matter how seasoned as a speaker they are, they aren't. The TEDx brand is a democracy of ideas. They're yeah. not looking for famous people. They are looking for people who want to be there with something to say. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you're giving me like a whole new connection to the brand. Yeah. I have never felt specifically drawn to like I need to have that experience like a lot of entrepreneurs are, but I also know that there's something for me to learn in having to do something that is more structured, that is more just that framework like yeah. you were talking about. So not that this is about me, but you're really helping me rethink even just like where and when that could fit in. So you've worked with hundreds yeah. of people at this point. Yeah. What are some of the coolest outcomes that you've seen the TEDx or TED Talk opportunity provide people, whether it was something they went in with that intention or not? Mm -hmm. I would say, well, I mean, first that second TED Talk for myself, I got a speaking agent. He put me on a speaking tour. I took my keynote fees from 5K each to 30K each talk. I got six book deals and I got an international licensing deal on my courses in Asia that I still get royalties from. So all from the one, just one that one TED talk and a half million dollar spokesperson deal. <laughs> Casual. Yeah. It's so like really, wild. Yeah. And what is it uniquely that being on that stage provides versus any other, we can even say like big stage right. in the world? Well, so this is really interesting. First of all, the differentiation between TED and TEDx. So both of them have 40 million subscribers. So I don't know where else on YouTube you can go that 40 million people are hanging out in the algorithm waiting to listen to you talk for more than 30 seconds. Yeah. It's active viewership. It's not passive viewership. Mm. And YouTube is treated like a search engine where people mm -hmm. are looking for solutions to their problems. And the SEO and the rank that TEDx has is higher than pretty much any other mm -hmm. channel. So if you are a content provider, a subject matter expert, you are messing with the highest quality content channel that you could get yeah. from a search perspective on YouTube. Mm. Um, so just SEO alone, you're going to get seen faster. Yeah. Um, Second of all, if you do well on the TEDx channel, the TED channel picks you up and you get a second wind. So once my TEDx talk went viral, TED released it separately. Yeah, because they are, people may not realize they are two different platforms. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, so TED is the main brand, yep. right? We don't touch TED. It's pretty much invite only. We have written some TED talks, but we haven't yep. booked anybody on a TED stage. Right. Those brands are different. Um, the, the TED brand has licensed out to just about anyone who wants to host a TEDx, which is, you know, a licensed out model. So people can apply. It costs money. It costs resources to host a TEDx event. Mm -hmm. And that's why we've seen about 13,000 of those all around the world pop up. But not all TEDx events are created equal. Some entrepreneurs, especially since they're high achievers, they'll come into my business and say, OK, let's get my talk written. Let's get me booked on stage. I'm like, great, great, great. And then they'll say, okay, but what's the best TEDx stage? Uh, and I tell them, it doesn't really matter if you're at TEDx San Francisco or TEDx Timbuktu. As long as the event has been run before and you're not a guinea pig, got it. you're good. Like yeah. you just don't want to be showing up at an event that's never run and it's disorganized and chaotic and your audio is going to be bad. Yeah. So yeah. we only book clients on events that have already been run before. Okay. Um, another thing is the license size. You know how much the TED brand, and this is just my own opinion, so... We kind of feel like we have a sense how much the TED brand trusts a TEDx event. Yep. When they, I don't know, they get like this really good sense of audience size. Like if there's a bigger audience size, chances are the TED brand 
is giving trust to that TEDx yeah. event and allowing them to have more humans yeah. there as part of their license. So the Makes bigger sense. the event, the bigger the license, the bigger the trust. But does that really mean you're going to get more street cred through your YouTube link? Probably not. Right. It actually That has no implication. They don't even know how many people are in the audience. No, you can't tell at all. Yeah. Okay, I'm thinking about this through the strategic lens of someone who's listening to this, who's had a TEDx talk on their radar, who's now realizing there is someone who can help them pretty much write it, produce the whole entire thing like your agency does. Is there a time that's more aligned in terms of using it as a strategic business advantage? What do you want to have set up on the back end so that you're ready for virality Mm -hmm. if it happens, whether it's immediately or six months down the road, a year down the road? Exactly. What do you want your business to be prepared for in the case that the best case scenario happens and now you have all this view? There's a real strong amount of people that come out going viral with us. And I will say there's some things that they're doing for that. But when it comes to preparing, I would say the most important thing is the bio beneath your YouTube video. A lot Mm. of people don't realize TEDx has a lot of guidelines around how you self-promote. Yeah. You can't just say as a business coach and somebody who helps entrepreneurs make money, like you can't get up there and say that you risk your talk getting pulled down. Yeah. So and they will ban your talk if they don't if they don't like the guidelines that you did or didn't follow. So it's important that you abide by those. But you can shamelessly self-promote in your bio beneath the YouTube clip, and people see that in their periphery. Um, The thing is, you see the first 80 words, and then it says, read more here. Mm. So most people are not going to click read more here. So you have to be very intentional from a lead generation standpoint about what are you sharing in those first two or three lines that people can Mm -hmm. actually see beneath Mm -hmm. the talk. Mm -hmm. What about from, and this is like your strategic brain as a business owner, what do you want your business to be prepared right, for? Right, like what assets terms of, do you want to have? Well, exactly, because if if a bunch of new traffic comes to a website that's yeah. janky, yeah. is it a missed opportunity? You know, that's kind of where my mind goes is like, yeah. if someone's considering this and they really want to use it to their strategic advantage, yes, there's the cases like you shared where you didn't actually have a business. Yeah. It was just you were also ready to capture the attention that was coming to you by saying, yeah, email me, we're going to set this up. And then there's also going into it knowing that, hey, I would like to be in the best position to capture this attention and look professional as a result. Is there any strategy there or do you go into that with your clients at all? Yeah, a lot of clients ask about that. And my experience has been that TEDx, both of the talks I've done, both that have gone viral have been like a piece of layer cake in my personal brand that brings me more leads than anything else. Like I wrote 600 blog posts for Forbes and not one of them in my experience has done for me what one of these TED Talks have done. And I think about all the hours I put in. Mm. Granted, the lead generation, the website, I don't think it's going to break somebody's website because you can kind of see it coming Yeah, if it's going viral. Like mine went from like 5,000 views to like 15,000 views in a day. Yeah, And I was like, that's crazy. It took six months to get 5,000. Now it's 15 just in a week. Like what happened? Yeah, And then the next day I looked and it was at 20. And then da-da. so you, st- you sort of see it coming. Mm-hmm. A lot of people try to time things with the talks. Like yeah. oh, I have a, a book launch, coming sure. out. But We take, we write the TEDx talk in about two months over those four Zoom calls. Mm -hmm. We hand it off to the booking team. The fastest we've booked one of our clients is in six weeks from that moment. And they still have two to four months out from when they give the talk. The slowest has been two years Mm -hmm. because our commitment is we don't stop pitching you until you get booked. So we pretty much guarantee it. You know, like I don't like to say the word guarantee. It makes me scared, but that's kind of what we're doing. Yeah. And even then it's like you could change so much as a person. Yeah. So I tell clients like you can't really tag this to anything evergreen, like a TikTok trend or, yes, or anything so timely. True. You need to make it evergreen. So true. Um, can't tie it to like a book launch, but you can if you know you want to have a book and you don't have a book yet, you could put in your bio beneath forthcoming author. Yeah. Right. Like if you're planning to release yeah, a book, because so then that jogs people to go search for your book or mm. something like that. And that's a great way to think about it and even understand the timeline of how long these things can take. So what I love about your just your heart and who you are as a human is whether or not someone's got the resources to invest in the full service package that you offer, you really believe so much in what these opportunities can do. So for someone who's listening, who's maybe at a stage that they want to more DIY it, yeah, what are some tips to help someone really become TED Talk ready, Mm -hmm. whether they're going to pitch themselves now or in the future. But what's your advice for how to really prepare yourself and dial in your message? Yeah, I just told a friend yesterday, she's like, should I hire your firm? I'm like, "Mm, you're not taking home enough of a paycheck for yourself to be investing in this right now. So I like to help people that aren't in that 
space, you know? Yeah. I would say the first thing is structure. Like when I got that TEDx talk when I was working in national security, I found a speechwriter who was working in the Obama administration. And I said, can you give me some tips? I'm about to give yeah. this thing and I'm about to embarrass myself. And he <laughs> sat me down for 20 minutes and he actually gave me a speech writing formula that to this day is the cornerstone of really? our whole speech writing approach. There's like the opening story and then there's talking points and then there's your conclusion. So mm -hmm. if you're writing a 12 minute talk, that's like four pages, right? Yeah. So your opening story is probably the first page. And then you end your story with where's this talk going? Today, I'm going to talk about this and this, right? And then there's probably no more than room for one, two, three talking points mm -hmm. at most. Mm -hmm. I would say two. And so you really have to think to yourself, what is your topic? What story from your life has moved you deeply? What's a vulnerable moment? What's something important to you? Mm -hmm. And there's two types of stories that we always uh, find we see in people's intake forms when they sign up. One type is like, we call it the cheap shot. It's kind of okay, like, what's that? that's like the crazy story. That's like, well, obviously this is a crazy ass story. We could just use this. It's going to do great. Yeah. It's a crazy story. Everybody's going to pay attention. It's not relatable though. Mm. We have one client. Um, he got out of a, two car accidents, both fatal untouched he was the only person that survived that's a crazy story yeah you want to hear more about that what happened yeah well, sometimes you play to people's fears right like my tedx talk from 2019 is my dad in the kitchen getting a phone call i was kidnapped like that's mm -hmm. like so off the wall that people are like mm -hmm. what happened or is she okay mm -hmm. like how is she even here talking mm -hmm. she got kidnapped so mm -hmm. there's the curiosity there's like hijacking their amygdala and scaring people like whatever mm -hmm. you want to do um but the other route we can go, which is just as powerful. And I really want to highlight that for people listening. Cause some people are like, I don't have a crazy story. Yeah. Do I need to make people cry? Right. Do I need to hire someone to kidnap me yeah. right now or yeah, it's fake like, a no, kidnapping? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, the yeah. answer is no. That's like content creators gone wild. Like I've, I like got some sort of heist happening with my own dad. Like I wouldn't put it past somebody. <laughs> right. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. All of a sudden you see like someone using your story um, anyway i digress but the other the other one that's just as powerful yeah so the other approach is just like a deeply vulnerable story we yeah. actually had a client come in she didn't have any crazy off the wall cheap shot kind of wild stories but she had deeply vulnerable stories she talked about in her intake form how she had this moment in high school where she felt kind of pudgy and kind of like out of place and not popular and she went to this party and the girls told her like oh this guy is interested in you and he was like the popular guy mm -hmm. she went to the bathroom she like fixed up her hair and she overheard them outside the bathroom and telling him that like she wants to and the guy said, ew, gross, not her. And it was like, that is mm. so human. Like, we all get embarrassed. We all misstep. We all have things we don't want people to mm. know. We have a client right now who, like, never shared with his audience that he faced 25 years in prison time and he got out of it out of luck. And he is only ready now to share these stories. Wow. So it's like the amount of people who have deeply honest stories. And like Martin Scorsese says, he says, what's mm -hmm. most personal is most creative. Mm -hmm. And we as a company, I, I feel like are so creative. Mm -hmm. And I think anybody can channel that because mm -hmm. the portal into creativity is being personal. Yeah. And I do think there's a boundary between like what's personal and what's private, right? Like you don't need to like TMI people and feel mm -hmm. embarrassed. Mm -hmm. But I do think that that line can be walked through sharing with people close to you and figuring out where to go with stories Yeah, and, and kind of getting comfortable, like putting it on like a pair of pants. So I would really start to look at what are some inflection points in your life that really change the way you think, change the way you are as a person and what story do you want to open up with? And good speech. And if you're not a good speech writer, by the way, and you're listening to this, Find a writer in your budget to help you because mm -hmm. this is not a talk that you just kind of figure out yourself. Yeah. If you're, this is not yeah. your zone of genius. Yeah. Um, we're definitely not like the cheapest agency out there, but I do think we're the best. But I think that people can invest in very affordable writers and creative direct their writers. Yeah. You know, we have creative directors on our calls. If that's not something you can invest in, you know, find a creative friend that yeah. can help you brainstorm the direction mm -hmm. of your talk. But the opening piece in a 12 minute talk to give people structure, that's a page, that's the first page. And then the remaining two or three talking points are page two, three, page three and a half. And then the bottom half of the fourth page is your conclusion. So that's structure for anybody listening. Yeah. And then if you hire a good writer and you brainstorm with a friend, 
and you get deeply vulnerable, I think that's a really good starting pack for somebody mm-hmm. to do it. As far as getting booked, I proudly don't know too much about it because the booking team is like fire and they're all over it. But what I do understand is that it's a numbers game and you need to know TED guidelines. So one guideline that anyone would easily violate if they didn't understand this or they didn't listen to this episode is probably self-promotion. Right. Instead of saying as a career coach for millennials or as a leadership consultant for corporations, that's like a that's a cheap shot at your self-promotion. And yeah. I understand it. Instead, make your self-promotion a reveal. And what I mean by that is, for example, we had a client who opened up a bank. His story landed him into opening up his first bank. So it was like we revealed what he was without having to say, as the founder of a bank. Got it. Instead, we did a whole story that ended with him opening up his first bank. Makes sense. So I think make your your identity and business a reveal, not Mm -hmm. a conjunction of as of this person, as of that. Yeah. That takes some time. That takes some effort. Don't put the pressure on yourself to have it right in the first, second, third draft. Have it right in the final draft. Like, Mm -hmm. just write it as you write it and then get back to it later. Yeah, yeah. So brilliant. Okay, so I want you to talk a little bit about the agency because it is a premium service that is, like you said, it's the best and you really get what you pay for. And there are going to be people listening who, whether it's now or whether it's down the road, are going to remember this and want to know, okay, how do I get in touch? Where do I do a consultation to find out if I am a fit. So whatever you want to share about the agency and just where people can connect with you. Yeah, I get what you're paid for. I have the payroll to prove it. I feel like I look at that every like, month. Look at my wow, these sheet. are very talented humans. <laughs> I'm okay. Um, okay, so I would say our website's wisewhisperagency.com. They can learn everything there. And we're always running two months out working with people because unfortunately, it's just been so hard to find the caliber of speechwriter I'm trying to find. Yeah. Um, to give you an idea, the our chief speechwriter, I found her in AP English in high school. Um, she used to stand up and share poems and I would like cry in the corner of the classroom. Wow. And I remembered her name forever. I was going to say, did you go and track her down? Yeah. I found her to help me write my book. Wow. And then I just told myself, like, if I do anything with yeah. writing, she's she's, she's going to be a part of it. Yeah. And every single speechwriter that's been a top performer, I asked her, who's as good as you? And this is a hiring tip for anybody listening. I found that when I'm trying to hire, like, don't post a job posting. Just yeah. ask your best person who's as good as you. Yeah. And most people know they're really good because if they're really good, they know. They know it. Yeah. And they're like, oh, don't know. And uh, she actually recommended another uh, speech writer after mm-hmm. thinking about it for six months. So that's how we've grown. So we're always about two months out from starting people. Yeah. But the whole process is outlined on Wise Whisper. It's two months to write your speech, four Zoom calls, like I said, hand you off to booking. It's totally done for you. Um, and if you listen to this episode within the first 90 days of its release, we're happy to give you a thousand dollars off. Just let us know you come from Lindsay. So um, generous. We love doing that. So generous. And I'm honest. Anyone yeah. who comes on, if they don't feel like they're a good fit, I'll tell them. Yeah. Yeah, that's so brilliant. Yeah. I feel like this just opened up a whole world for me. I'm so grateful. It's so good to reconnect with you and just like you really too. get to follow along with the important work that you've always been doing. But it, there's a different tone to this. Yeah. That's, you're right. It actually is such the perfect parallel to all the different seasons that you've walked through and just Isn't it ultimate odd? permission to constantly evolve. You know, it's interesting what you're sharing because a lot of people who have left have said, and, and this is just a new thing that I'm realizing because I was like, I'm going to create Wise Whisper Agency and just blow up people's brands and make them more revenue just like I did. But mm-hmm. now people are coming out and they're like, wow, I'm I'm a speaker now. And part of it was their TED Talk. Part of it was their own effort, right? Mm-hmm. And I mean, TED Talks are kind of a given if you want a speaking career, I guess. But I mean, these days. But they'd say, there are so many messages I have that I give that were based on all those brainstorms and Zoom calls with your creative directors. Wow. And I really didn't know that stuff about myself. I didn't even know that I thought that way. Yeah. And you guys pulled it out of me and it's kind of like therapy. Yeah. And we've been able to do that from anything from activists to CEOs to senators running for office that come in, celebrities to everyday humans mm-hmm. trying to make a mark. Mm-hmm. And to be a part of their thinking in that way yeah. to impress my gift through them and just let them be a vehicle for however I'm trying to make an mm-hmm. impact I think that's what business is really about. Mm. And there's so many entrepreneurs that I used to write my book for that are feeling lost, feeling like they're not doing what they're meant to be doing. And I hope that 
you remember like life happens in seasons. Sometimes you won't know what's next. And if you can let yourself be in the divine unknown and mm-hmm. not hold on to a plan for the sake of having one, mm-hmm. um, because some people are not in a season where it's time to go get on stage and share a message. Mm-hmm. Their story is still being written by them. Mm-hmm. And that's the best news ever is mm-hmm. that you get to write your story, even if you use a writer to help you. Mm. So, so well said. And I feel like it's it's bringing me back to the reality too, that there's all these probably little moments where whether I have someone help pull it out of me or whether I'm just journaling and doing it for myself, those going back to those stories, yeah. those are like our ultimate connection points with the people we want to serve. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So final question, I just kind of want to turn it to you and it's a personal reflection, an opportunity for you to think back to either a story or like a recent moment, something really beautiful that you want to celebrate yourself for. It's like an opportunity for all of us to pause and realize like you saying the story that's being written right now, there's so many little things that I overlook constantly to pause and just acknowledge the beauty of right now. So we just call it a powerhouse moment. Yeah. Anything big or small, but it's just an opportunity to acknowledge yourself, to celebrate something. So when I say what's a recent powerhouse moment that you want to celebrate, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? I feel like in my 20s, I wanted to be someone and be famous or something. Yeah. Like you just want to matter. Yeah. I feel like in my 30s, I don't care like what um, people think as much. Yeah. I just want to make an impact. Yeah. And the fact that we have 50 people right now that we are writing and booking TEDx talks for, mm. like the amount of impact for me, that just feels so quantum. Mm. That feels so 10x of like who I am and what I can do. Yeah. And I yeah, every I'm in love with what I'm I'm doing and I think that's a very special place to be in life. And it's like that's the place where all the other good stuff flows. Yeah, people you know? when you're you know, I I used to tell people like there feels like there's three lily pads in our career. The first mm-hmm. one is like you're fine and you don't want to change it and it's like fine. A lot of people hang out there no problem, mm-hmm. no judgment. The second lily pad is what my book U-Turn tried to do is what's your zone of genius? Yeah. And can you get to that lily pad? Yeah. And then the third one is Dharma. I think that you can't you can't get there unless you've been in your zone of genius. Cause when you're great, life becomes a game of yes or no. People see how great you are and they start to give you opportunities left, right, and center. That's where I'm at right now. Mm-hmm. It's like so much opportunity is mm-hmm. coming my way. Mm-hmm. And in order for me to achieve my Dharma and get to that third lily pad, it's on me to know carefully what I'm saying yes to. Mm, so well said. Thank I you. think I'm I think I'm looking at my third lily pad too. Yeah. Or just little frogs. Yeah, just in a little pond. frogs swimming about. Some just of the swims take a few years couple in between laps. these pads. Yeah. A couple laps. I'm kind of tired. Yeah. Tired but for that's sure. So well said. And I'm just so grateful. Thank you so much for stopping by. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me.